Hello guys, my name is Vijay Kumar Vaka. I am working as Senior Solution Consultant in Episero. In this session, uh, let us see uh, the second uh, the second part of MuleSoft interview questions and MCQs. Yeah. So the first question is, what are the differences between flow, private flow, and subflow? So this is the table I have created. So yeah. So flow has source and processor sections, right? We'll have two parts uh, when you drag a flow onto the canvas. And uh, I mean, we'll configure the source as well as the processors, okay, for flow. Now coming to private flow, it, it will also contain the source, but we'll not use anything in the source part. And we'll configure the process processors as well in the processor part. Now th third thing is subflow. Subflow does not have any source part. Uh, it only has processor part. Now, um, yeah. So if I show you, this is the subflow, right? So we don't have that category here. Now this is private flow. Though we have a facility to configure the source, but we, we will not be configuring this. So then only we call it as a private flow. And this we call as flow because it has uh, we, we have configured something in the source part as well as in the processor part now flow level error handling uh, will be there for flow and the same is the case with the private flow but you will not have any kind of error handling for subflow so you see here we have error handling part uh, the same way we have error handling for private flow as well but we don't have any uh, of such option here in the subflow. Now, um, there is some option called as initial state uh, that will be there on both flow and private flow, but you'll not see that on the subflow. If you select this op this portion, right? Just select this flow. You see, we have something like initial state. So, with the help of this thing, right? You can you can stop start or stop that particular flow. The same is the case with the private flow. You can start and stop this one. You have this option here, but you don't have that option on the subflow. Also, one more thing um, which I haven't mentioned here is that you can allocate multiple threads here, or even for private flow as well. But there is no such max concurrency option for subflow. Okay. So subflow will inherit the exception handling or strategy, okay, from the parent flow. But you can, we can have a flow level error handling for both flow and private flow. So, yeah, for better explanation, you can you can check this uh, video as well. Now the second question is, what is the output from for each scope? So these are the options: transformed output, same as input payload. Uh, to the for each scope, any of the above or none. So the answer is, whatever the payload we send as an input to the for each scope, that will be the output after the for each scope. So that is the uh, what is a catch here. Even though you you do some transformation within the for each, uh, that's not reflect outside the for each. Okay. So I have given few resources here, the mule documentation and the video which I have already created. You can look at it. You can uh, look at those if you require a better explanation. Now, which flows can be called using lookup function? So, we have some function called as lookup. And uh, uh, let us see this. Uh, so, lookup function in mule4. So this is the syntax. You could see something like this in the mule documentation. Look up and you'll have three params, like three parameters. One is the flow name. So you'll have to configure the flow name. Second one is the payload. Uh, it can be of any kind. And third, third one will be the timeout in milliseconds. Okay. So by default, it will be like uh, two, two seconds or 2000 milliseconds. So yeah so so the the question here is that what is 
what are the flows that you can call using the lookup function the answer is only private flow you cannot call subflow that is the catch here and the answer is for this question is private flow you can try uh, calling a subflow it will throw an error okay so yeah, i have given few more references here yeah let's go with the fourth question so what is horizontal scaling and vertical scaling uh, so as we discussed in the previous session right in the uh, in the mule soft interview questions and mcqs so we we discussed about worker and v core now uh, given that we know about worker and v core so if we talk about horizontal scaling and vertical scaling if you adjust the number of workers for a mule application right then we can call it as horizontal scaling that means you are increasing or decreasing the number of instances for a mule application so that we call as horizontal scaling and if you adjust a uh, number of v cores that you have allocated to that mule application then we we call it as vertical scaling so you can increase or decrease the number of workers or number of v cores if you increase the if you increase or decrease the number of workers that means uh, uh, you are increasing or decreasing the number of instances for that particular application that that we call as horizontal scaling and if you allocate more memory or less lesser memory uh, i mean that means uh, less number of v cores or more number of v cores that means we, uh, that is what we call as vertical scaling the fifth question is what is the use of upset operation in salesforce connector so basically upset operation uh, is part of a salesforce connector and th this will help you in either creating a new record in an object or it will help you to update a uh, existing record uh, within the same object now this is how the configuration will look like for the upset operation and here where you you'll choose the upset operation sorry the object name and here you have to configure the external id okay so based upon this okay um, uh, it will either choose whether to create a new entry or to create an uh, or to update uh, the existing entry within that object okay so here we will be passing the payload and yeah so this will help you to either create a new entry or update the existing entry within the object so that is the use of offset operation it can do both the operations but the, uh, but based upon this particular value you will choose one of the uh, fields uh, within that object and based if it is there already uh, within the payload that you are trying to upset uh, what it will do it will update that particular record if it is not there in the object uh, then it will create a new entry in the object now differences between transient and persistent object store so we have discussed a very little about object store now when we talk about the differences between uh, transient and persistent object store so the transient object store is faster but the persistent object store is slower right now it is not reliable because because the entries whatever you are going to store that will be stored in the in memory of your application or the heap memory but here when you choose uh, the object store as persistent object store what happens uh, the key value pairs are actually getting stored in the amazon dynamo db in the background so that's why you will get more reliability with this but these this is not reliable you cannot rely on this so so it does mean that the data does not survive a mule runtime crash so if if the mule application goes down whatever you have stored in the in memory of uh, in memory of that application they will be erased but even the mule application goes down or crashes okay or okay so what because you are storing in the amazon dynamo db so that is where you are getting the uh, reliability right so even if your mule application crashes that's okay once it is up and running uh, we still have the values that we have already stored okay now the last and final point is that 
uh, by default right uh, i mean by default the object store will have the persistent persistence nature so unless until you explicitly change it to transient so this is the by default nature of the object store and this is this is in order to have the transient object store you have to explicitly uh, choose it as a transient object store so these are the few differences between transient object store and persistent object store now uh, this is a very simple question that how to handle errors at processor level now we know we can handle the errors at flow level or we can handle uh, the errors at uh, i mean you can maintain a global error handler as well to handle all the errors from all the flows or mule default error handler can also handle if you don't maintain any error handler but what if you want to handle the errors at processor level itself so for that you have to use triscope okay so i have given few resources here you can check that now explain about mule for event structure so this is also one of the interview questions that uh, they'll ask you to explain about the mule for event structure this is a very basic thing so this is how it looks like and it contains message variables and ex exception message so message again will have payload and attributes so you know uh, we always uh, uh, look for payload as directly like payload only not like message dot payload so but if you if you look that uh, if you try message dot payload or if you try payload there won't be any difference actually okay uh, again when when you uh, look for the attributes right we enable the expression mode and attributes dot headers or attributes dot query params or attributes dot URA, param URA parameters all these three you can see in the attributes and many more you can see in the attributes so along with the payload right from postman for example if you send query params or URA params or headers those will reflect or will come in the attributes and if you define variables right within the mule uh, flow so they'll be part of the mule for event again so if you don't define any variables then the size of that uh, vari uh, variables will be zero if you define few variables the size will increase to one or two uh, like wherever you are checking the mule for event in the debug mode it all varies actually now at, at last exception message right by default you'll, you you won't see this but unless until you get some issue you won't see that but if you get some issue or if you get some exception uh, then you'll see uh, this uh, exception message in the as part of mule for event so but this is the uh, structure of mule for event now it's a very simple thing so what is the full form of raml and it's uh, a current version or recent version so the restful the full form of rest uh, raml is restful api modeling language and the version is 1.0 okay let's go with the final question i have given one data view exercise so this is the input and this is the expected output okay i'll share the link of this ppt uh, in the description of this video you can copy this input and work on this uh, uh, data view script so that you you'll get this output or expected outcome is this one so you can work on the data view script so i, I also have given the uh, data view script in this ppt itself so i'll share this ppt you can have a look at you can verify that if you want but this is the input and this is the expected output and this i am giving you as an exercise you can practice on this okay so thank you so much for for listening to uh, this video uh, i'll come up with one more video uh, as soon as possible thank you so much